Uh, so yeah, for those of you who don't know, I um, work for a company called Monzo. Monzo is a startup bank in the UK, uh, and only the UK for the moment, I'm afraid. Um, over the last three years, we basically built a bank from scratch. We got a banking license. Um, we built our own core banking system while knowing quite little about banking, a lot of us at least. Uh, and now we have about 700,000 people who use us as their bank in the UK. Uh, Monzo is built uh, in and for the 21st century. And one thing that I think really makes us different from a lot of other banks is our community are involved in everything we do. Uh, actually, one of my new favorite things is, is a Twitter account called Making Monzo, which has popped up this week. Um, and I think it's fair to say that Monzo is without being too hyperbolic, a bit of a cultural phenomenon, at least in London. Um, these kind of hot coral debit cards can be seen more or less everywhere in London. And with the, with the fabulous hot coral card, we have a great app as well. We have um, a big focus on UX. Um, and our thesis is to kind of move mountains behind the scenes to make it simple for the customer. The difference from is hopefully clear right from you when you open the app. Um, things from this very cute little guy to um, things that are much more than that. I think fundamentally Monzo is trying to be on your side. We um, try and help you understand your finances. And for many customers, including people like me, I think that's probably for the first time in their lives that they've been able to do that. Um, we try and make transactions actually make sense. So instead of the kind of cryptic all caps information you might be used to from a bank, we try and show rich information about transactions. So locations, automatic categorization. We let you upload receipts, split your transaction with friends, set targets for how much you want to spend in a month and be warned if you're spending too quickly. Um, every time you spend, you get a notification with emoji, which I'm very pleased with. You'd be surprised how much of our backend code is dedicated to handling emoji. Um, we, we felt it was very important for us to be able to own the entire stack. So we built a core banking system from scratch. The platform now has over 500 microservices, and it's built entirely using open source software. Owning the stack means we also very strongly own our uptime. And this is the story of one of the instances in which we sort of failed to do that. Um, this was an outage from last October. Um, it was one of the worst outages we've experienced, and it was certainly the worst that we've experienced, which was kind of caused by things that are within our control. So as I mentioned, the entire bank is built using open source software, and one of the principal technologies we use is Kubernetes, so everything runs on Kubernetes. Um, and that's kind of one of the fundamental characters in this outage, along with etcd, where Kubernetes stores all of its state. For those of you that don't know, this is kind of a rough architecture diagram of how Kubernetes works, which I pulled off the website. Um, basically, the Kubernetes is split into two components. You have the control plane, and then you have the pool of workers where all of your workloads will run. The control plane is a set of processors that ultimately are communicating via an API server with etcd to put their state in etcd. So that's why Kubernetes and etcd are important to this. As Andrew mentioned as well, we uh, were, I would imagine, probably the first large user of a service mesh um, in production. So we, we've been using Linkerd now for quite some time. And in a system of 500 microservices like we have, you do a lot of RPC internally. So one request from a user might fan out internally to be tens or even hundreds of RPC calls. Um, and Linkerd is what mediates those RPC calls between all of the thousands of containers that are running. So Linkerd works roughly like this. You have service A wanting to talk to service B. It talks via Linkerd to do that. And Linkerd handles things like retries and load balancing transparently. And service discovery, to do that, it communicates with the Kubernetes control plane as well. So also implicitly relying on etcd. Um, the final thing that's sort of a character in this outage are humans. In every incident, kind of by definition, humans are involved if there's an incident. Like, it's something your system has probably failed to handle by itself. Um, and their actions are pretty important in this one as well. So to start the story, um, the first thing that's relevant to this actually happened two weeks before the outage itself, which was when we upgraded our etcd cluster. We have many etcd clusters. The one that's relevant here is the one that's, that's backing the Kubernetes control plane, storing all the information about what's running in the cluster and where, what should be running in the cluster and where. Um, and we, we were upgrading from etcd2 to etcd version 3, as well as, ironically, um, making some resiliency improvements. Um, 
this is relevant, this upgrade is relevant because it later triggers a bug which we'll come on to talk about. Um, but the next thing that's relevant to the, the timeline of this is one day before the outage, when um, an engineer deployed a faulty service to production. This is something that's not particularly unusual to deploy something to production and see that the behavior's not as you'd expect, so it's kind of standard procedure to um, scale that to zero in this case, because it, it was for a feature that hadn't yet been released to customers. Like I think one talk mentioned yesterday, everything at Monzo is kind of, the rollout of everything is controlled by feature flags or experiments and things like that. Um, this service was crashing, basically, um, so the engineer scaled it to zero while they investigated. Um, this is relevant because deleting a service and scaling a service to zero in Kubernetes are not the same operation. So you, you can have a deployment that still exists in the API that isn't actually running any workloads. Uh, basically, it has zero replicas, but it still exists as far as the API server is concerned. Um, but there was no outage on this day. Um, the outage started when um, this day in October when an engineer deployed a change to our ledger. Um, the ledger is a pretty important component in a bank. It contains information about how much money every customer has, so it's fairly important that it works. Um, but the ledger is written and released like all of our other software. It's, it's kind of just another service from the perspective of Kubernetes. Um, and deploying services at Monzo is very routine. We release services more than 100 times a day, usually. Um, when this change to the ledger was deployed, there was a large increase to RPC errors as seen by services that were calling it. So the natural action was to roll it back. Um, something we like to say at Monzo is don't do something unless you know how to undo it. Um, so that's exactly what the engineer did. Um, but after the rollback, the requests still continued to fail. So that indicated there was something going on that wasn't a logic error with the service itself. So the engineer called for help at this point from everybody else, and our like, internal incident process starts. Um, a little while later, a few minutes later, engineers determine that Linkerd is not in a good way, basically. Um, so what it's doing is it's misrouting traffic that's meant to go to the ledger, and it's actually going somewhere else. Um, as I mentioned, the way that Linkerd works, it communicates with the Kubernetes API server, and it basically synchronizes its state with what Kubernetes says is the state of the world, the state of the cluster. As you might know, every pod in Kubernetes gets its own IP address, which is dynamically assigned. So when you make a deployment, your sort of set of IP addresses that represent that deployment are going to change when you, when you roll back or roll, when you roll forward or roll back. Um, and this deployment did exactly that. Uh, and Linkerd was sending traffic that was meant for the ledger to the IP addresses that the ledger used to be at. So it's no longer there. So basically, it's just going into a black hole and the ledger is not reachable. Um, as I mentioned, we ran some internal diagnosis tools. Um, which showed us the kind of load balancer state in Linkerd was not correct, having these wrong IP addresses. We'd seen some smaller scale problems like this before with Linkerd. Um, so it was a reasonable assumption to us that this was basically the same problem on a larger scale. And we didn't at that point understand the root cause of it, but the workaround was basically to restart the affected Linkerds, which in this case was unfortunately all of them, and there are hundreds of these. Um, but we didn't really consider this to be a risky thing to do. Like restarting services, restarting things like Linkerd, not an unusual thing to do. Um, so we've, st we've, we've now restarted a few of these Linkerd pods. We haven't restarted them all. And we noticed that the ones that have been restarted are not starting correctly. Um, we have many replicas of every service. So at this point, there's no real effect on most services because there are still other replicas of them that are reachable. Um, we see that the, the reason they can't start is the kubelet, which is the agent that runs on every, every node in your Kubernetes cluster and is responsible for making sure that the things that should be running on that machine are running on that machine, can't get the configuration for Linkerd from the Kubernetes API server. The API server is responding with 500 errors, basically. Um, in the theme of restarting things, we then tried to restart the API server of Kubernetes, which did actually fix this problem. All the Linkerds that were failing to start started, so that was nice. Um, and we continued restarting the remaining Linkerds, as we mentioned, uh, as I mentioned we were earlier. So about an hour in, um, and we finished restarting all of the Linkerd pods at this point. And just as we did, this happened. Um, all of the alarms basically started to go off. Um, and some of them are really simple things. So this one um, is 
basically just like a ping against our API. And the fact that we can't respond to that properly means there's something seriously hosed. Um, and at this point, we basically have a total outage. Um, we notice now that a lot of the Linkerd pods are logging a null pointer exception and crashing basically continuously. Um, so yeah, that, that's why no traffic can get around the cluster. Linkerd is involved in all the RPC, and there's no RPC happening because Linkerd is crashing. Some furious Googling later, and we find there is actually this known incompatibility between the specific versions of Linkerd and Kubernetes that we're running. When we deployed this version of Linkerd, we were running an older version of Kubernetes. We'd since upgraded the version of Kubernetes. Um, and the incompatibility is specifically around services that have no replicas. So as I mentioned earlier, like that one that was deployed and then undeployed the day before, there is now this service that exists in the API server that has no replicas. Basically, we just deleted it and everything, everything, you know, order is restored at that point. Um, the outage is over. So overall, this was a pretty horrible outage. Um, we had about an hour and 21 minutes in which the cluster was not functioning as it should. But the vast majority of things, and especially payments, did continue to succeed throughout. And um, for an outage that was as long and as bad as this, we only had two complaints from customers. So I think in terms of like user impact, it wasn't, it could have been worse, let's put it that way. Um, and payments are one of our most important business metrics. Our customers care if they're able to access their money, and we care that they're able to access their money. Um, after every incident, like I'm sure a lot of you do, we have a post-mortem process where we analyze the root cause of things and learn whatever lessons we can from it. In this case, the root causes are kind of complex. I'm going to go into them now. Um, the first one that was responsible for... Um, why the Linkerd pods couldn't start when they were restarted until we restarted the Kubernetes API server was because there was a bug in the gRPC client library. And etcd uses gRPC for communication. So the Kubernetes API servers, when they talk to etcd, are using gRPC. And um, basically, there are several issues in the etcd client library, were several issues in the etcd client library around connection resets. Um, and that had happened a few weeks earlier when we upgraded the cluster. So we, to upgrade the etcd cluster, we rolled the nodes effectively, and we'd caused these connection resets to happen, triggering this client bug in the Kubernetes API server. The second thing which um, explained the null pointer exceptions was this incompatibility between the specific versions of Kubernetes and Linkerd that I mentioned. And this was because of a breaking API change that had been made to Kubernetes in version 1.6. So prior to 1.6, this is how Kubernetes represented an empty endpoint set. And after 1.6, that's how it represented an empty endpoint set. So Linkerd wasn't expecting that field to be nullable, and it just failed to pass the JSON and crashed with a null pointer exception. So really somewhat silly little error with large consequences. Um, the final root cause of like why this was so bad, I think, was human error. So we made several fairly poor decisions as a team. For example, restarting all the Linkerd pods wasn't actually necessary. Um, and if we hadn't done that, I honestly don't think we would have had an outage in the way that we did, or at least not one that was as customer visible as it was. Um, I think also, as humans, we didn't have enough information about what to do that was easily accessible to us. And I'll go on to sort of talk about that. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, the, the post-mortem process is designed to, as I'm sure you all know, um, understand the root causes of an outage as well as get lessons from it. And I think they're really the silver linings that you, you have in outages, are the things that you can learn. Um, and it's very important to us that we do have as much learning as we can from these things. Um, I think the first one is we didn't have enough monitoring, but more importantly, the monitoring wasn't visible enough. So um, it should have been really in our faces that restarting Linkerd across many hundreds of nodes was gradually killing the cluster before it was too late. And it, it wasn't obvious enough to us, basically. Um, so since then, we've overhauled the monitoring system. So we have a better monitoring system that can have metrics with a finer granularity. But I think more importantly than that, we've made it more of a practice within our team to basically have graphs for everything and think about, think about what you should be alerting on much more and basically put, the, put graphs all over your office and make them impossible to ignore. Beyond the 
kind of operational lessons, I think um, there's this principle of defense in depth, which was talked a little bit about in the, in the panel just before now, as it applies to security, but I think it applies to resilience as well. Um, it's defined as the arrangement of defensive lines or fortifications so, they, so that they can defend each other. So it clearly predates the, the realm of computer security. But I do think this is a really important um, principle as it applies to resilience as well as security and actually was one of the big success stories of this incident. Um, as I mentioned, we want to own as much of the stack as we can. We think that's very important for us. And that means we want direct connections to payment schemes. These are things that many banks won't even have. Um, they will use a third party in many cases to do this. And that's something we've decided we don't want to do. So we have a direct connection to MasterCard, for instance. Um, direct connections usually will not run over the internet with very rare exception. So they mean physical kit and physical connectivity in a data center. So it's kind of fundamentally incompatible with running our entire platform in AWS. You cannot just take a wire to AWS and say, please plug this into the cloud for me. Um, so we have this physical data center edge layer in addition to the cloud, which is where most of the software of the platform runs, which basically is a proxy between payment schemes and AWS. Um, so though the payment processing happens in AWS, it has to transit through this physical edge layer. And actually, in this case, it gave us an opportunity to to add more resilience to the system instead of it just being an annoyance that we have to deal with. Um, in this case, even though basically everything in AWS wasn't working, we have a fallback system in this edge layer which lets us authorize payments subject to some fraud controls if all else fails. And then when the backend comes back, replay them to the backend. So this, this still allowed our customers to continue accessing their money um, throughout this. And I think it really paid off. The, the other principle I think is really important um, and something that's also quite, um, quite young in the, in the Kubernetes community at least is that of chaos engineering. So this is um, something that was popularized by Netflix among other companies. They have a system called the Simeon Army and um, it's their way of implementing chaos engineering which is the discipline of experimenting on a distributed system in order to build confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions in production. Um, so the Simeon army has many components. One of them is the chaos monkey, which um, basically runs in Netflix's environment, including production, and kills services and hosts at random to ensure that they can continue operating. You know, their, their streaming service continues operating even in the presence of failure, which we acknowledge is kind of um, inevitable in the real world. But it lets you do it in a controlled way um, rather than it being uncontrolled. Um, or rather, giving you confidence that when it happens in an uncontrolled way, you know exactly how the system is going to react. Um, I think if we'd been doing this, if we'd had an analog of the, the, um, the chaos monkey in production, we probably would have caught these problems much longer, much sooner than we did. Um, if we'd been killing, for example, Linkerd pods, or we'd been killing nodes, these problems would have been, been exposed before we deployed the ledger. Um, and we probably would have caught it days before without it even being an outage. Um, as I said, I think this is actually a field that's quite young, especially in the Kubernetes sense. There are not that many tools out, out there for it at the moment. There are some, but I, I'm, I'm not aware of them being kind of deployed very widely. I think this is an area I would expect to see lots more companies doing lots more work and would like to see lots more companies doing lots more work, including us. Um, the final uh, thing I want to talk about is uh, transparency. So one of the most important aspects of our culture at Monzo is, um, is transparency. We have this notion internally that everything should default to being transparent. Um, so there are certain things for which, it, for which there is an argument to be made for not making them public, for keeping them private. But for us, the default is that it should be transparent unless there is a reason to keep it private. And when you look at your entire company through that lens, you find there's actually very few things that need to be kept private. There are, of course, some. Um, but we have lots of kind of... You can learn lots about our company. Frankly, while I've been here, I've learned things that are happening at Monzo based on what's been posted publicly. Um, and in this case, that led to us publishing this post-mortem on our community forum. Um, 
This was kind of inspired by my personal love of reading postmortems. Like AWS in particular has some really fascinating ones about what happens when AWS goes wrong and goes really wrong. Um, and I think often people learn the most about systems, or at least I often learn the most about systems, by learning how they go wrong. Um, this postmortem was read by tens of thousands of people online, um, including, crucially, some of the maintainers and contributors to projects like Kubernetes and etcd and gRPC. Um, and basically, this let us get to the root cause of what happened much quicker. The problems were, as I described, quite low level. I think it would have taken us far longer than it did take the community to understand what was going on. So this really kind of, this really helped us as well as helping everybody else. And I think the community is one of the most valuable aspects of, of like cloud native technology. And it's easy to overlook. Um, I think if I had one message though, it's that I think um, we should all learn from each other's experiences, good and bad. I think as a community, we're quite good at talking about when things go well. We're not so good about talking about things when they go wrong. And I think we could all benefit from sharing those things. Um, shameless plug, if you're interested in working on systems like this, problems like this, do come and talk to me or check out the website. And also uh, follow me on Twitter. And Talk to me after. I think Monzo has had more than its fair share of um, problems in production and uh, lots of war stories to tell. Cool. Thank you, everybody.